you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Oh, once you choose it, you can get it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. So uh, if you will, just get there uh, real quick with me. Uh, today, for high schoolers, uh, we have a lake day for the high schoolers at Jim and Kathy's uh, place. The address, I believe, is in the bulletin. If not, holler at Keaton or Jim. They can get that to you. That's from 3 to 7 today. So uh, that will be a super fun time for high schoolers today. Uh, this Wednesday for middle schoolers, going to Evansville Mall for a scavenger hunt, which will be super fun. I know all you adults are super jealous of that for sure. That's from 3 to 9. You'll meet at 3 o'clock if you have a middle schooler, and then they will get back around 9 o'clock this Wednesday. You can see our back-to-school bash uh, is the 13th uh, this coming Saturday from 4 to 8. This is something new we're doing, okay? So we're just trying to do something for our community, let our church know that, hey, we're thinking about you. It's a big time for a lot of kids in our community, a lot of students, and, uh, man, I'm super pumped for that. I'd love to have you here, not just as a participant, but as someone who is interacting with other community people. You know, this this back to school bash is going to be an outreach thing. It's not so much necessarily for our church. It'll be super fun for us to attend. But man, I, my hope is that you'll be interacting just as much with. Um, I don't. I don't. I really don't know. I'm, I hope we have 500 plus people. I just. I don't know. We're going to have. The gas cards and food and inflatables and face paint and music and games and all kinds of stuff. So, like, I, I have no idea what the turnout will be, but I hope you're here to help us partner with this community outreach event. That is 4 to 8 this Saturday here at the church. Uh, Keaton also said if you have a couple cornhole sets, uh, if that's you and you would be willing to ju so generously lend your cornhole set to us for that Back to school bash, holler at Keaton, and, and uh, he would love to acquire that for this Saturday for us. Okay, next Sunday, the 14th, look at your bulletin. There is a church lake day, so not just the high schoolers, but next Sunday it's all of us in the room. Somebody say, say thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, for an all-church lake day, not just, not just high schoolers. So that's going to start at 4 o'clock and go till dark. So we'd love to have you. Whether you're swimming or not, doesn't matter. Come out. It's a great day of fellowship. Uh, next Sunday at four o'clock. And then finally, this is a couple Sundays away, but there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer for date night uh, on the 21st, August 21st from six to seven 30. There's daycare. That'll be a youth fundraiser event. So uh, if you're willing to participate in that, make sure you get your name on the sheet in the foyer before you leave today. We'd love to have as many people as possible for that. Okay. Let me take a breath. <sighs> All right. Let me pray for us in a uh, Let's continue going in song. Dear Lord, I thank you uh, just for all the things we got going on. Um, I, I love, um, one of the reasons I think probably almost all of us love Sunday mornings is, is fellowship, is getting to interact with other like-minded believers and, and just be plugged in with our church family and get to come and worship Jesus and just grow more and, and be filled up as a Christian and be sent out and commissioned to go throughout the week. Lord, I pray that that's what you do today, is that our fellowship is intentional, that we're intentional with uh, our worship, regardless of our circumstances. As Job said, blessed is the Lord who gives and blessed is the Lord who takes away. Blessed be your name all the time. Uh, whatever our circumstance, we can always give you praise for what Jesus has done for us. And it's on that note that we go into song time today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing, Blessed Be Your Name. <laughs> Did you know we were singing? Blessed Be Your Name.
Bless your holy name. Amen. Amen. Oh, amen. Graves into gardens. This is one the kids, the youth really enjoyed at CIY, so we'll throw this one out for you guys. I search the world. It couldn't fill me. Your man's empty praise and stories of faith are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied. Here in your love, yeah. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. As the God of the mountain, as the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. song i i was struck recently uh, listening uh, to a, a testimonial on j vernon mcgee how many of you here in here have ever heard of him got a few out there right he's a 
Uh, he was born in 1904, died in 1988, and when he was 61 years old, uh, he was given six months to live with cancer. But 23 years later, the Lord was finally done with him. In that time, he established through the Bible, which is an app you can go to every day now, and just any verse of the Bible, any chapter, whatever, you can click on that and, and hear what he's got to say about it. And he's a very wonderful, fundamentalist, conservative uh, preacher, uh, but with over 600 radio stations worldwide, he had accomplished so much, but at the end of his life, they asked him if he had any regrets, and he said his only regret was that he didn't teach more on the Holy Spirit, and that just hit me like a brick that, wow, um, we're really missing something here, uh, the third person of the Trinity, and and we, you know, I've been remiss at uh, not focusing more, if you will, on the, on the Holy Spirit and, and what he does for us as he, he daily builds into our lives and, and cleans us and, and, and just working in our life on a daily basis. But we need that power of the Holy Spirit in our life. So we're going to do that song, Holy Spirit. Emily's going to take the lead on this. And, and one thing that uh, I would encourage you just as just prayerfully uh, uh you know, let, let us become more aware of your presence. We'll be singing, let us experience the glory of your goodness. Oh, Father, we need your pow the power of your Holy Spirit working in our lives daily. So uh, let's sing that. There's nothing worth more Love will ever come close, no thing can compare, you're our living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is
glory, God is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Oh, Father, we cry out, we need the power of your Holy Spirit working in us. Help us turn to him for guidance and yield to that voice and speaking softly. In Jesus' name we pray, and they all say it. Amen. Good morning. A few days ago, I was reading in 1 Kings, the third chapter, about Solomon asking God to give him wisdom. And right after that, in that same chapter, the story that most of us know, and there was two ladies and one baby, and they were just trying to say whose baby it was. So Solomon let the first lady testify, and she said that we both live in the same house. And when I was asleep and she was asleep, she rolled over on her baby and suffocated it. So she came into my room while I was asleep and changed babies. That baby is mine because when I woke up the next morning, I knew this wasn't my baby. The other woman said, no, it's my baby. So King Solomon says, well, bring my sword. We'll cut the baby in half. Give a half to one and half to the other. And the real mother said, don't kill the baby. Give it to her. Give it to her. Please don't kill it. And the other one said, well, this way it won't be yours and it won't be mine. Pretty easy to tell from that. The one that loved the most gave the most. And you know, all through my life, I've noticed that the people that love the most give the most. And that's really why we're here this morning. The one who loved us the most gave the most. God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son to give his life and to shed his blood, because it said without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And we needed our sin to be forgiven. And we're reminded of that every Lord's Day when we take that bread. Because Jesus, if you remember, he said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. For you and me. I mean, he took that beating. He had that crown of thorns shoved on his head. It wasn't just set there, they shoved it down the nails into his hands and to his feet for you and for me. And then he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, the covenant whereby if we'll confess our sins, he'll forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And really, so this morning, when we come and we eat that bread, there's three words that I've used about every morning in my life, and I think everybody should use theirs, because no matter what the world throws against you, we need to remember those three words, God loves me. And he proved it right here. Let's pray. Our dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the love that you've shown towards us. We thank you especially for sending your son to give us a path where we might live with you. We pray that you would bless each and every person who partakes of this. And let us always remind, no matter how bad things may get or how good they are, that you love us and we love you. Be with us, lead us, guide and direct us always, for we do pray it in the name of our blessed Savior, Jesus. Amen.
Hello, hello. Hey, we are in Matthew 14, so get there in your Bibles. Uh, Kids, you can head back to Children's Church if you're going back there. Uh, If you're new with us, we have time for two-year-old to fifth graders to have Bible class time during our adult sermon time. Uh, So feel free to take part of that if you'd like with your kid or grandkid. Uh, You can see behind me new graphic, new sermon series today. We had covered the past four weeks of surveying the scriptures, looking at that uh, biblical poll that we did in church here at our house and uh, in-house. Um, and we move on to this new sermon series that we're starting today called Risky Business. Um, as you can probably imagine, how many of you would consider yourself a great risk taker? Okay, there's like a couple of us in here. How many of you would say, I hate taking risks? So probably the larger majority of people. And probably the rest of us are somewhere in between, right? You're probably saying to both of those questions, what's the risk I'm taking? How many of you were asking that question, right? So we're all across the spectrum as far and wide on the topic of risk taking. I thought that this was interesting. It says this in Proverbs. Oh, that went way too far. Hello, come back here. Proverbs 10, 21. Fools are destroyed by their lack of common sense. Somebody say, amen. <laughs> now, now, we first need to point the finger at ourselves, right? That, that we have been destroyed by our own lack of common sense. During the sermon series in Risky Business, we're going to be looking at good risks. We're going to be looking at foolish risks. We're going to be looking at rash risks. We're going to be looking today specifically, you can see in your bulletin, on this topic of unavoidable risks. Okay, so think about this in several ways. I remember my psychology teacher in high school, he pointed this out, which has somewhat scarred me for the rest of my life. (laughs) Have a unique way of doing that. Uh, He said, isn't it crazy that we drive 55, 60 plus miles per hour, you know, almost every day, whether you're on 50 or uh, going 130 to Newton or Albion or whatever, going to floor wherever, do do that quite often where we're going at a pretty fast speed and we're only about five six feet apart from the car going in the opposite direction not a surprise that that many of us probably know people who have been in car accidents maybe we have ourselves but nonetheless we get in the car to get us to and fro right and that we understand that there's some unavoidable risk potentially that might or might, might not happen driving a car flying in a plane right the majority of planes fly out and come in safe landing but there are some that go all right, how about the food or the drink that you put into your body? Now, some of you may check and, and research every single thing you put in your body. Um, I don't. <laughs> uh, there is some unavoidable risk. I can't blame anybody but myself if, I had, if, I, if something happened, namely from the food or the drink that I ate. Um, think about bowling. Um, if you've ever been bowling, I've heard this. This will scar you for the rest of your life. I've heard that one of the top five dirtiest things in the world is bowling ball finger holes. <laughs> There's some unavoidable risks that we take, right? If we want to go bowling, odds are probably most of us don't own our own customized bowling ball. And so what do we do? We rent the shoes, we rent the lane, we get the ball, and we put our fingers where only the Lord knows what is in those bowling ball holes. There are some risks that are worth taking because at the end of the day, there's just some unavoidable risks that's baked into just about what we do day to day. You probably don't think, when I was talking about risk earlier, you probably don't think of, if you're not thinking yourself as a risk taker, now you might be thinking, wow, there is really a lot of risks that I take on a day to day level, but I do it because it's unavoidable. Mark Atterbury in his book, he talked about a girl that had went with her dad or family or somebody to an NHL hockey game. Little girl, I don't remember how old, probably eight to 15 years old. Slap shot, got hit, uh, went over the glass, hit her in the head. She died from that. And you might think, man, you know, I, I, I don't think any of us plan on going to a professional sporting event and dying as a result of participating as, the, as an audience member, as a fan. And uh, so, so we get this idea that there are just some things in life that Something bad might happen, but, but to some degree, it's, it's unavoidable because it, it may happen, but it, but it may not. That leads us to 
our passage today, this is, I'm just going to preface, this is a jacked up, messed up, sinful passage in the Bible. And guess what? It's not the only one of its kind. There are many like this in the Bible. But I thought there are three major players here, John the Baptist, King Herod, and his wife Herodias. And, and I want us to see with each of those characters this unavoidable risk that each one of them took in this passage, good and bad and ugly. Read with me, Matthew 14, 1 through 12. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John previously and bound him, put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him in to death, he feared the people because they held him, John, to be a prophet. Verse 6, but when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. The king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. She brought it to her mother. His disciples came and took the body and buried it. They went and told Jesus. Uh, this is just <laughs> not maybe the most encouraging passage in the world, probably, to say it lightly. But let's talk about this unavoidable risk that I think happens with each of these three major players in the text. Here is John's unavoidable risk that he takes. Preach against sin and, and the, the inevitable result of continuing to go down that lane of preaching against sin. Sin is a big deal. God offers repentance and grace and forgiveness to those who would like it. But you, but you have to call sin, sin. And you have to get to this place of humility to say, woe is me, I'm a sinner. I need salvation from God. So this was John's message. He was known, as, known for this baptism of repentance. Thousands by the droves are coming out to the Jordan River to accept this baptism of repentance. So what he's doing here with Herod is not specifically, I, I'm opposed to Herod uniquely and specifically. I, know, I only talk about King Herod's sin, but this is how John would converse with anybody. He, and he would probably say the same about himself if I had to get to that same place too. So John was consistently pointing out sin. Look what it says here in verse 4. John had been saying to him, Herod, it is not lawful for you to have her. More on why it was unlawful for Herod to have Herodias in a little bit. But take note in verse 4. John had been saying to him. That is that it happened more than one time. That he kept coming back to this issue. Politicians are good at what? Showing you their left hand when their right hand is over here. You ask a pointed question to King Herod and he switches the conversation. Well, let's talk about the, the pipeline that's going in, in, in Galilee, right? You know, let, let's, uh, well, I know that's a big deal, but let's talk about, and redirect, right? But John just keeps coming back to this issue of adultery and incest with King Herod and Herodias, his now wife. And he says, bro, you got to repent. You got to turn from this. This is not good. God's law says this is bad. It's sinful. Doesn't matter if you're the king or not. There's no partiality with God. You, just like me, just like Joe Smith next to me, we're all expected to live in the same way according to God's law. So he keeps going down this lane, as verse 4 says. He had been saying to him, he keeps bringing this up to King Herod. And eventually, when you do that, what happens? You get canceled. You ever heard of cancel culture? Surely not in today's society. But this is what happens when we talk about sin, God being upset with somebody because of their sinful state. What the world often does in response to that is to say, put the earmuffs on to cancel that person and move on and invite people or churches that's, that say, I'm welcome as I am and stay as I am, right? That's the difference of the truth. It's come as you are, but get changed by Christ should be our message. So it's all-inclusive, anybody that wants to come. 
But it's exclusive in the sense that you, you don't stay as you are at the same time. You let Christ transform. That's the expectation. That was the expectation with John that he had with Herod. Now, we Christians come from a great line of risk takers, don't we? Abraham in Genesis, God says, just get up and start walking. How many of you right now today, if God revealed himself to you and said, hey, just pack up um, one bag and just start walking north. I'm not telling you where you're going or when you arrive or how many days it'll take, how many years. I, I, have, I have no other details. How many of you would take the risk and go? Abraham did, right? Rahab, she gets these two spies come into her, her, her house and she goes all in on God's people just like that saying, this is my once in a lifetime shot. I'm in Noah when no one else wanted to please God in his society. He says, man, I'm going to listen to God's word. God is telling me to build this boat, even though I don't know why I'm going to do this. We'd be here all, for the rest of the month talking about all the risk takers in the Bible. But this was John's unavoidable risk. And it says that he lost his head because of this. So it would be well phrased, not original to me, but it would be well phrased this way. John is willing to faithfully lose his head instead of his conscience. Is the same true for you? What is, what, what is the cost for your Christianity? I'm not suggesting that the takeaway from the sermon today is go and get in everyone's face and start pointing out all their sin until they're blue in the face and don't want anything to do with you. But what I am saying is, as we talked about last week, sharing the gospel, we do have to get into people's personal life and say, Man, as a friend, this is not good. I, I, I'm telling you about the dangers ahead in eternity because I love you, because I care about you, because that's what John is doing with Herod. It's not because he wants a different king, he wants a different politician. He said, I want to see you, Herod, in God's family just like me. That's the motive there. You probably have noticed this and observed this and experienced this yourself. Confronting sin often makes people furious. Have you noticed this? Take Stephen, the first martyr in Acts, Acts 7. He confronts the religious leader's sin. And what do they do? They cancel him permanently. They stone him to death very violently. So John's unavoidable risk here is that he just keeps going down this road. He's not compromising, saying, this is still God's truth today, Herod. Tomorrow, this is still God's truth, Herod. The next day, this is still God's truth, Herod. You still need to... He, when we keep going down this lane of God's law is good and true and right, and there, there is an opportunity to be saved from your sin, that's the road we want to go, the John the Baptist road. But as we go down that road, the unavoidable part of that is that people are going to cancel you in one way or another, right? Maybe you've experienced this already. So you need to wrestle and get to a point today, is it worth the cost? And as you've heard me say a million times in eight years here, your Christianity should be costing you something. If your Christianity isn't costing you anything, don't call it Christianity. Because Christianity is always costly. Here is Herod's unavoidable risk that I see in the text. Is that as you consistently go down the road of silencing your conscience, to Jim's point, quieting the Holy Spirit's conviction in your life, as you do that day after day, after month, after month, after year, after decade, after decade, eventually what you end up, the, the unavoidable risk from doing that all the time, every day, is that eventually you, you silence God permanently in your life. John the Baptist is God's mouthpiece, quite literally, in Herod's ear saying, that's really the only conscience he has, seemingly at this point, is what John the Baptist is saying to him. Now, this is what's interesting. Look at the text, verses one and two. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. He said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. This is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. And then from verse three to 12 is a flashback. Did you get that when, you, when we read that? The large majority of this passage is looking back as to what Herod did with John the Baptist. But verses one and two of chapter 14 is Jesus, Herod is getting reports of who Jesus is, how he's teaching, these miraculous signs and powers he's doing. And what is he, what is he, th he's haunted. 
He's thinking, this is John the Baptist that I killed. He's back from the dead to get me. Because who else could do the stuff that like John was doing? So he's haunted from him quieting the conscience and finally cutting off the head of his conscience, John the Baptist. He's really presented with two options in our text. Either silence his conscience or lose good public relations with the community. That's the rock and the hard place he's at is John keeps pointing out the sin. The tabloids keep getting outrageous. People keep talking about my adulterous, incestuous relationship with my wife Herodias. This is always on the news all the time. I turn the TV on, Herod is thinking, what, what am I going to do? Am I going to change the news headline or am I going to change my life? So he picked, let's change the news headline. He went into damage control. His public sin became a public relations nightmare. This is what's super interesting to me. Mark, in his gospel, records this same story in Matthew 14. And it says this in Mark 6, 20, when Mark is writing about the same narrative. It says, for Herod feared John, knowing he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. You're thinking, what? <laughs> what? It, it's that King Herod kept him safe. I don't know if that means he had a, a private solitary cell for him, if he put John on house arrest. I don't know exactly what that looked like. We can theorize it's not important. But he went out of his way to keep this righteous and holy man, John, this seemingly only conscience he has, safe. And it seems that he would get his own private sermons from John from time to time. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed. You ever been perplexed? You know, ah, this is good and bad. I don't know what to do with this. But yet he heard him gladly. So he keeps coming back. As much as John is a pest, Herod keeps coming to him week after week. You know, whenever chapel is in the prison. I don't know what it looked like. But he keeps coming back to him and sitting in on... Because he knows, and this is true with every unbeliever in the world, that God has put a conscience in all of us. That God's moral law, you don't need the Bible to understand if killing someone is good or bad. We all understand that is universally what? Bad. God, God has hardwired this into everybody where we all get this understanding of this is good. This is, when I'm coaching my girls, four and six, right? And I, I'm asking them, was that a good choice or a bad choice? I don't tell them I asked them it was a bad choice. Why do they know as a four and six year old? Because God has hardwired it into them. They know even as a kid, this, that was a bad choice. I know I shouldn't have done it, but I did it. I love this passage from King David. It says this in Psalm 32, four through five. David says, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. In the, in the verses right before that, the beginning of 32, he's describing living in a sinful state contentedly, not doing anything about the sin in his life, just like King Herod, just going day to day, managing sin, trying to overcome the conviction, trying to get rid of the conscience within him. He, and, he, and, he said, and he puts this image that says, God's heavy hand was upon me. And then he says, finally, I acknowledge my sin to you, God, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So what happens as we manage sin instead of repent from it is that God's heavy hand, metaphorically speaking, just weighs us down day after day after day. Have you felt this before? This is why we have the phrase, I think, it, it feels like I got this off my what? Off my chest when we confess something, right? That's Psalm 32 speaking. Because we know that it, ju it just keeps getting heavier. The guilt keeps getting heavier. The shame keeps getting heavier. The, the, the conviction just gets weightier and weightier and weightier until we are as flat as a pancake or in the ground because God's heavy hand just keeps coming down an extra notch each day, heavier and heavier and heavier. That's happening with King Herod in this passage too. But instead of being liberated from the weight of God's heavy hand, he just keeps on sinning all the more. Even Luke writes about this interaction in his gospel. Luke 3, 19 through 20. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him, John, 
for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all that he locked up John in prison. So Herod just living in sin. I mean, it's just summed up all the things that Herod had done, all the evil things Herod had done. Who knows? I suppose that's a long, long laundry list of stuff that's not mentioned in detail by the text. But come back to this. It says in verse 6, When Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Mark Moore notes that Herod doesn't make the offer to Herodias' daughter for good choreography, right? This is why this passage is so sick, is that there are certainly major sexual overtones here of what Salome, Herodias' daughter, does to her stepdad, Herod, in front of a whole room of adult men. I don't think I need to elaborate on that to paint the picture any more clearly. But as Mark Moore notes, this is not just a good dance routine that she does. Herod is not sorry enough to do what was right. You know, when he's hearing these sermons by John in prison, and he keeps going back to John the Baptist time after time, I think part of him is sorry. Part of him, he knows this is good. Part of him knows I should submit to this teaching. I should submit my life to God. I should repent of my sin. I should accept John's baptism of repentance. I should do these things. But I think what Herod did to John by cutting off his head is what the world of unbelievers today does with the Holy Spirit. Is that we know this is bad, but it's good. I remember my youth minister asking me in high school, our youth group, is sin fun? And all of us were like, no, no, no. You know, giving him the Sunday school answer. He said, well, sure it is. It is fun. That's why we do it. Is because it provides immediate satisfaction and gratification. Whatever the sin is. Not thinking long term, thinking short term. So we all get that. What Herod did to John is what the world does with the Holy Spirit. Now, now his unavoidable risk was he kept silencing his conscience. Eventually, he unavoidably silence God. But here is Herodias, the wife's unavoidable risk, is that she kept being the manager of sin in their family household. And eventually, as you just keep staying in this lane and on this road of managing sin, day after day after day, instead of repenting of sin day after day after day, eventually you're going to sin in ways you never expected. You ever experienced this in your life? I know I have. Where you were sinning in one way and you thought I can control it and I can keep it secret and private. And eventually as you stay in that lane and manage your sin instead of repent, what I found out is that you sin in ways you never expected to sin. And this is certainly true with Herodias. She's trying to get rid of the PR nightmare just like King Herod. Except in her mind, pimping out her daughter is not outside the realm of possibility to her own husband, of all people. People are super messed up. We don't need to read Matthew 14 to understand that. But here is the Herod family tree. This will paint the picture for you a little bit more clearly. So up here is Herod the Great, okay? That's the Herod when Jesus is born, right? He gives the, the, the decree, kill all the babies two-year-old and under, in Bethlehem, right? I want Jesus off the map. I don't want any competition to my throne. So that's this Herod in Matthew 14. That's his dad, okay? So he has all these wives right here. I know you can't really read any of this, but just look at it for symbol's sake. And so right here is Herod Antipas. This is the guy that we're talking about. This is Matthew 14, Herod, okay? Over here, we have Herodias, who comes from these brothers, that's the Herodias, that's his wife, okay? So you're probably already thinking, yeah, that's bad. So this brother, Philip, is the first one to marry Herodias, his niece. Then Herodias and Herod Antipas, they cross paths, and they decide, hey, we're going to commit adultery, we're going to run off together and start a new life. So the one uncle steals the niece from the other uncle. This is where we're at. And then Salome, Herodias' daughter, is the one that comes in and does much more than good choreography for her great uncle slash stepdad. 
You with me now? As I said, people are super messed up, right? That's what's happening here. That's the layout of this Herod sick family background. Sin more. You will always be sinning more to manage your current sin. It says in Mark 6, 19, that Herodias had a grudge against John the Baptist. I think that's saying it very nicely. She wanted him dead every single day. So much so that she gets to this point. Look at this sickening phrase in verse 8. Prompted by her mother. This was not the little girl's idea to go and do this. It was mom putting it into her head, indoctrinating her. I need you to do me a favor, sis. I need you to go to your stepdad and his drunk buddies at his birthday party and put on a show. Prompted by her mother. Sickening. I remember watching Shrek uh, recently and Lord Farquaad, the, you know, the kind of the villain in the story. He gets up and he's commissioning all his people that are in his city to, to go out and catch Shrek and kill the ogre. And anyone who does this, uh, you know, is, is, is going to, or no, it's actually to rescue Princess Fiona from the castle. Anyone who does this, you know, is going to get rewarded. And he says this at the end of his speech. He says, some of you may die, but it's the price I'm willing to take. Right? I think that's Herodias way more than Lord Farquaad. Right? My daughter may be sexually exploited, but it's the price I'm willing to take. She may be traumatized the rest of her life, but it's the price I'm willing to pay. She may be a throwaway statistic 10 years from now, but it's the price I'm willing to pay, says Herodias, prompted by her mother. It says this in verse 11 to even expound, to compound the point. In verse 11, his head was brought on a platter given to the girl and she brought it to her mother. That word girl is unique in the Greek language. Um, in another instance where we read that word girl in the Greek, it's in reference to a 12-year-old girl. So Salome, Herodias' daughter, is somewhere probably between 10 and 15, if I had to guess. If you're wondering, what is the age of this girl? Not that it matters, but it just compounds the point all the more. The girl knew what to do and asked her mom what to do. Sex has been manipulated throughout human history. We get this. Which, let me compound the, the narrative even further. In Mark 6, 21, where Mark is recording the same story. It says, an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. That's who's at this birthday party watching this 12-year-old girl parade around on her stepdad. It's not this secret club of raunchy, debased men even though that is what they are, certainly. But no, it's the nobles. It's the military commanders. It's the, quote, leading men of Galilee. And you're probably thinking what I'm thinking. Who's going to step up and do something about this? Is anyone going to intercede and advocate and protect this little girl, which is what she literally is? Is any guy going to have the confidence to say, Guys, this is way too far. This is so out of bounds. Is any guy in that birthday party, at Herod's birthday party, going to say, we need to stop this locker room talk and action? Not one person did. Not that we read in the text. So let me just say this as like a sidebar, kind of unrelated to the sermon. We need so much more godly men when, when that stuff is happening. Maybe not to that degree, but... But any type of that talk or narrative or action or joking or whatever it is, will you join me as being a godly man that, that actually speaks up in the room and say, yeah, can we get an amen on it? Girls, you can amen that too. That's okay. Are, are we there? I mean, we, we think that the, we're just a sexualized culture. We got to fight against this. We got to be sexually integrous and say, man, this is not okay. I don't think that's funny at all. We need to make it awkward in the room. We need to make it awkward in the locker room. We need to make it awkward on the golf course. We need to make it weird. People need to feel the sting of their sin. This is why God has put a conscience in us so that we can turn from this. Herodias' unavoidable risk was that she kept wanting to manage sin her whole life. You know, I don't think five years ago she would ever thought, I'm going to pimp out my daughter in five years to my own husband. 
But when you manage sin, I promise, I promise, I promise, you're always going to sin in ways you never expected. Here's a big idea in all this. Is that when you run from God, expect to be haunted every day. That's what's so obvious to me in this text uh, of this flashback of verses 3 to 14 or 3 to 12. And when he when he hears about Jesus, he's getting these reports about Jesus. He's haunted by John is dead. John is dead in Matthew 14. It's a flashback. And he's still being haunted from the grave by what he did to John the Baptist. So this big idea is important to get today that when you run from God, expect to be haunted all the days of your life because of your unrepented sin. If you will turn with me to Luke 23 as we close out today, because this isn't the, the only time that this Herod shows up in the Bible. He also shows up here in Luke 23, verses 6 through 12, when Jesus is getting passed around like a rag doll during all his bogus trials, he goes, Pontius Pilate gets wind, oh, Jesus is actually in this Herod Antipas's jurisdiction. So he passes the buck to Herod, our guy, from Matthew 14 we've been talking about today. Read this with me in Luke 23, verses 6 through 12. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man, Jesus, was a Galilean. When he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him, then arraigned him in splendid clothing. He sent him back to Pilate, and Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity, hostility with each other. This is crazy to me. That, that Herod was, quote, very glad in verse 8. That he had long desired to see Jesus. Which is weird because the first time he's hearing about Jesus, he's haunted to death. But now time has passed. He's seemingly not repented from anything in his life. He is so numb to anything spiritual, anything conscience related, anything Holy Spirit related, any type of holy or righteous talk or deed. He's so dead to all of it. That this is where he's at. He just wants Jesus to put on a show and say, hey, can you shoot fireworks in the sky? Hey, can you do your walk on water thing that I heard you did? Hey, can you, can you, uh, do the, can you pull Leviathan out of the water with the fish hook? Can you, can you do something cool for me, Jesus? You think Jesus is impressed with that? <laughs> I'll look at this, verse 9. Herod questioned Jesus at some length, but Jesus made no answer. He knows this is where Herod is camped at for the rest of his life is in this lane of, I just like shows, I'm going to ask for signs, I like this cool, tricky, miraculous Jesus, but that's as far as my interest level goes. And if that's as far as your interest level goes with Jesus, Jesus has no answer for you. Just like with King Herod. I think it's just sickening that he was very glad about this interaction with Jesus but yet he was not sorry about the idea of killing John. He was not sorry about being outwitted by his own lust. He was not sorry about his drunken tongue making an oath. He was not sorry about his adultery. He was not sorry about the false imprisonment of John the Baptist. He was not sorry about his abuse of political power. And he was not sorry about his statutory rape of his stepdaughter. But yet he was glad to see Jesus at the end of Jesus' life, before he hangs on a cross for all the sins of the world, including King Herod's. <sighs> it says this in Numbers 32, 23. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure. How confident? Be sure your sin will find you out. This big idea, when you run from God, expect to be haunted, it's all over the Bible. And it's not a cruel and unusual thing that you would be haunted over your sin. But it's a, it's, the conviction is to act as a warning. 
you're, you're continuously going down this wrong road. This unavoidable risk is going to happen for all eternity if you don't act on the haunting and turn to Jesus. Think of how different King Herod's life could have been if in that moment he would have interceded for Jesus. He would have said, I don't need a sign. I need to lay on my face before you. You're God's son. I'm so such a sinner. I can't even begin to describe all the sins I've done. Man, it could have went a lot different for King Herod. I thought this little detail is interesting. I'll close with this. In Acts 13, 1. You, 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 I've read right past this so many times. It says this. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. That's the same Herod Antipas that we're talking about today. Isn't that interesting? Menaean and Herod have the same family upbringing. Went to the same school, got the same education, had the same circle of friends, probably that were kind of like these guys at the birthday party. But at some point in Menaean's life, he deviates from that group. Him and Herod, oh, they go way back, and they can talk, and they went to all the class reunions and everything. Oh, they go way back. But Menaean and Herod are different now. Because one, instead of being haunted by his sin, decided to follow Jesus. He became a prophet and a teacher in the Christian church at Antioch. But Herod, he stayed in that lane his whole life. And the unavoidable risk is, as you can imagine, hell indeed. So if you're running from consequences or God's truth today in your life, I'm here to promise you that it's not going to go away until you turn to Jesus. If you want the haunting convictions to stop, if you want God's heavy hand to loosen up all the way on your life, there's one answer. Repent and turn to Jesus. It's not just Herod and Herodias that are jacked up and messed up. It's me and you. If you read Matthew 14 and you think, thank God I'm not like Herodias or Herod, you're missing the point of the Bible. The point of the Bible is to say we are all jacked up in sin. We are all messed up. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But here's the good news today. If that's you and you need to get rid of this haunting conviction, you can come to Jesus today and be forgiven. Somebody say, that's good news. Man, most of us have accepted that, but man, maybe some of us haven't. So during this invitation time, man, I, I invite you to act on the conviction. Instead of muting it, trying to silence it, trying to kill it, trying to cut its head off, just respond to it. And in God's grace, he says, whatever your sin resume looks like, even if you think you're worse than Herod and Herodias put together, Jesus' blood is sufficient to cover you and give you forgiveness and right standing with God. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, I thank you so much that even when we sin egregiously, even when we're disinterested to turn from our sin and just keep on sinning every day, keep managing sin, that it actually says in Romans 5, 8, why we were still managing sin, why we were still making the decision to sin day after day and not repent day after day. That's when Christ died for us. If Herod and Herodias remind us of anything, it should remind us of ourselves that we're dead in our sin, that we need to listen to our conscience. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit's guidance and conviction in our life. Lord, if there's anyone in this room today that, that needs to take that first step and say, I got to get right with God. I got to give my life to Jesus. I have to get God's heavy hand off of me. Today is the day for them. Lord, I pray that they would draw forward and come talk to me during this invitation song and say, what must I do to be saved from this haunting feeling? Lord, for the rest of us, let us go from this place reminded that we need to repent daily. That even after we give our lives to Jesus, we still fall short of the glory of God, we still sin. We still need to be repenting. We still need to not be managing sin. We still need to be examples of purity and holiness in our spheres of influence that speak out and up against other sin that's happening and point people to Jesus. God, I pray you would use us to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.
close to you. Never let me go. Lay it all down again. To hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. So strive to draw close to you, Father. We pray for your cleansing fire to just work in our hearts, Father. Breathe on us again. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen for our send out today. We'll sing that uh, chorus part of Old Church Choir. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. 